Good morning, everybody. This is the day the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. I pray that the blessings of the Lord will be abundant in your life today. In Jesus' name. God is developing some giants here. And some conquerors here. And thank God you'll be a giant killer in Jesus' name. Why don't you close your eyes father in the name of jesus we thank you at this time we bless your name because of this glorious wonderful day and we thank you lord because you are going to bless your people and you are going to put something in part something in every heart will never be the same again in jesus name the power the authority the anointing the unction that we need to be more than conquerors give to everyone in jesus name Make your people channels of blessings. And let your grace multiply in every life even today. And not just today. All through this year, Lord, let there be a difference in administration. New strength. New power. New energy. New conviction. New boldness. New courage. Give to all of us in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see now we come to Titus chapter 2. Already we have started from chapter 1. And we have seen the ministry that Paul the Apostle had. How he referred to himself as a servant of the Lord. An apostle also of Christ. And then he's told us why the Lord raised him up. And now he was talking to Titus. And through Titus, he's talking to you and talking to me. That the Lord has appointed us. The Lord has commissioned us. And the Lord has put us in the place where we are. In the place of ministry. For a purpose. And then he tells us we cannot do it alone. As an overseer, we thank God for our overseers, our national overseers, our state overseers, and our region overseers, and all our leaders and ministers. That we cannot do it alone. Even Moses, I cannot bear this body in alone. Even Joshua, there were people that supported him and that went along with him. He carried them along. Even David. Yeah, the Lord has taught him his fingers to engage in battle. But even then, with all the knowledge and the skill and the ability that he had, he couldn't do it alone. Except Samson. That didn't train anybody. Except Samson. That didn't have any supporters, any disciples. And then did not have people that he trained to carry on the work with him. And there is no success without successors. You must be raising up people. And you are not just to preach as an overseer. And thank God our overseers know that. And you are the fruit of their labor. That's why they brought you. And they have trained you already. And we can see the mark of that training upon your life. You know, the goodness of the Lord will see here the way you pray and the way you commit yourself to the Lord. I can tell something has been parted into your life. And God has used these, our leaders, our overseers. I pray God will reward their work. But you see, all these people, there are some people like Samson that they just lone rangers. Although great power, great ability they have. And they can pull the poles or the, the posts of a city and carry it on the shoulder. But he didn't transfer that when he died. All that died with him. And that's why as you are being raised up, or you too, you need to raise other people. That's why Paul now said, Titus, I left you in Crete. That as I have selected, you know my love, Titus. Also, you know I have Timothy. You know I have Epaphroditus. You know I have all these Tychicus and all these other people. As I have raised up leaders, you too will raise up leaders. 
And these are the qualifications we'll be looking for. You look for this and this and this and that. That's what I look for in your life before you were chosen. And that's what you look for. And then you choose all these others. But then titles are the positive side. You know, if you have good eggs and you have bad eggs and you put everything in the same basket, the good eggs are not going to transform the bad eggs. You're going to have everything become bad eggs. Pick out those bad eggs. Their mouth must be silenced. And this is the reason why you're silencing them. They subvert whole houses. They overthrow, overturn, and destroy the faith of others. That's why you silence them. Even their poets tell us. Even their countrymen tell us their slow bellies, their covetous, and whatever they do, they do for personal, selfish motives. Silence them. Yes, they'll tell you. Don't call them for interview. Just watch their lives. If you call them for interview, they profess that they know God. But in works, in practice, in lifestyle, in behavior, in character, they deny him. Therefore, don't just depend on interviewing them. Check up their lives by their fruits. Ye shall know them. And then when you see, you'll see them as you look at their lives. They are incorrigible. Their consciences are hardened. They are defiled, they are deluded, and they are turned around. And it appears there is no way. Don't concentrate on them. And don't put all that I put within you. All the anointing, all the, all the unction, all your knowledge, all your skill, all your experience. Don't waste all that on them. They don't want to change. Concentrate on the people that are teachable. Now, you yourself, I will be studying it. I'm just revealing for you. You yourself, you will speak. And don't let those fanatical people intimidate you. Don't allow those multiplicity, proliferation of all those uh, quack churches. And quack a uh, kind of spiritual doctors. Don't let them intimidate you. Speak thou the things that become sound doctrine. As you go to the church for the first time, so Titus, you are new there. You're just a new minister that I send there. As you look across, you'll see old men there. You'll see old women there. You'll see the young women there. You'll see the young men there. You'll see the civil servants there. The employees there. Speak to them. Speak to them. And tell them, this is the standard of the word of God. And then as you speak to them, you'll make sure that they are done. The doctrine of Christ. And they exalt not themselves. They exalt the word of God. That their light will so shine. That people seeing them, they will behold their good works and say glory to God, glory to God. The whole world is not defiled. The whole world is not corrupt. There are some people, they are raised up as cleansing agents in the land. And now he wants to tell him how that will be possible. Because now Titus will be thinking this is a great work. How do you have such a transformation? How do you have such a change? How do you have such a good body of believers in a corrupt community? And now Paul is about to tell him, it is by the grace of God. That brings us to what we're looking at this morning is inexhaustible grace. We're looking at Titus chapter 2 verse 11. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God. Titus, are you wondering, how will that be possible in the corrupt environment? How will that be possible among the deceived and the deluded and the defiled people? How can you raise up the people that will become a cleansing agent? How can you raise up people that will be able to stand for the truth uncompromisingly? Because the grace of God that brings salvation... Has appeared unto all men. He says, it doesn't matter how bad anyone may be. It doesn't matter how corrupt anyone may be. When that preach that grace, 
speak about that grace exalt that grace publicize that grace and it is for everyone because the grace of god that bringeth when grace comes it doesn't come empty handed it comes with something the grace of god that bringeth that bring not that brought in the past not that will bring in the future today in creed titles where you are the grace of god that bringeth salvation is appearing now unto all that grace is what we're talking about you'll find out as you check up in your bible the grace of god is unmerited favor the unmerited favor of god to the undeserving it is the infinite mercy of god to the world a favor of infinite worth in itself that's grace and from the beginning of the Bible, when God talked about Noah, and Noah found grace in the sight of God until the end of the Bible, Revelation 22, 21, the grace of God still appears there. And there from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end, it's all of grace from creation to redemption. It's all of grace. From conversion to preservation. It's all of grace. And from justification unto glorification. It is all of grace. It's free gift. On the self mercy. Goodness revealed. From our salvation to the time we see the Lord face to face. The grace of God shines forth. As the divine force. That makes everything to happen. As can be expected this gift of grace god's infinite mercy has appeared unto all men to accomplish many things for us is the limited understanding of the grace of god that keeps believers spiritually poor impoverished proper knowledge scriptural understanding of the many-sided the manifold grace of god will make us spiritually strong Maintaining vital spiritual energy. Trusting in God to be saved by grace. We rely on him, not on ourselves, for righteous living. If you trust God for salvation, and now you're trying to work out righteousness by personal self-effort. It will mean that you came in by the Spirit. But you want to stay there by the flesh. And those two things don't work together. That means then we're to rely on the grace of God in salvation. In overcoming temptation. Even in ministry. Can I remind you? Number one, there is saving grace. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. If it's a gift, it's available for you. And nobody should complain, I'm not saved because of this, that. It's available, it's free. The grace of God that brings salvation. It appears unto all men, and it is the gift of God. Not only that, number two, it is sustaining grace saving grace sustaining grace it supports you sustains you holds you so that you will not for any time there's any challenge any temptation that wants to try your faith and pull you down you can go back to the throne of grace in hebrews chapter 4 i'm reading there from verse 16 let us therefore come boldly Unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It's not only that it saves, sustains, it sanctifies. It is sanctifying grace. This grace of God that comes and begins with us at the point of conviction. And it goes to the point of conversion. And it goes to the point of consecration and commitment until the culmination, the climax of our following the Lord. Grace all the way through. Sanctifying grace. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. 
Acts chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 32. Acts 20 verse 32. And now brethren. I commend you to God. And to the word of his grace. I commend you. I release you unto God. And to the word of his grace. Which is able to build you up. And to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. It's the grace of God that does that too. Number four, it is strengthening grace. Strengthening grace. What would we be? Where would we be when the enemy shows up with his threatening power? How could we stand without the grace of God? Second Timothy chapter 2. In Second Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading to you from verse 7. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Timothy, consider what I say. Timothy, you know your problem. You're too self-conscious. You're not conscious of the grace of God. And Timothy, have you seen any of these runners running the race and looking at their feet and looking at their toes while they are running? That's what you're doing, Timothy. That's why you're not plowing straight. That's why there is no courage. That's why you look timid. In verse 1, this is what I want you to consider. Consider what I say. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It makes us strong. Strengthened grace when you face some threatening challenges of life. And then you go back to the grace of God. That same saving grace, sustaining grace, sanctifying grace. It's also the strengthening grace. And also it's serving grace. It's the grace that makes us to serve. Titus, are you thinking that this new assignment, you didn't mind when you were sent to Corinth, you said, even though it was a difficult place, but they were not dangerous people, they were just difficult, and you know, I could still manage them, and then they had the gifts of the spirit, you know, the word of knowledge, and the word of wisdom, and all this, I face, and you know, I could talk to them, what I said, by the spirit, everybody will pay attention now, you're sending me to Crete, of all places, how about this? How do I serve in such a place? Number five, the serving grace. That when you get to a new location, it's the same grace of God. The grace that comes, comes at salvation is the same grace that comes for service. That you're able to stay there and minister. And you're not saying, get me out of here. Get me out of here, please. I don't even mind a smaller location. I don't mind even rural areas. But get me out of this place. There's, I cannot serve here. You are going to serve. And you are going to succeed. Because of the serving grace that's available. Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, I'm reading to you from verse 6. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 6. Having then gifts differing. According to the grace that is given to us. Think about that. Having then gifts differing one from the other. According to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy let us prophesy. According to the proportion of faith or ministry. Let us wage on a ministering. Or he that teaches on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. You see all the ministries there that the believers were involved in. And it says, it is by the grace of God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28. Serving grace. The grace that comes and you will serve. Hebrews chapter 12, we're looking at verse 28. Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. Let us have 
grace whereby through that grace will serve acceptably with reverence and godly fear and thank god this is sufficient grace you'll never be in any situation that the grace of god will not be sufficient this year testimony will be coming from your location this year every thursday or friday whenever you have your available hour your people will testify of the grace of god coming from heaven coming through you and coming through your messages and coming to them in jesus name you are the same person in that same location that will be the pipeline and the channel of the grace of God to this same congregation you are looking at. That congregation is not the same anymore. Because the grace of God will flow through you as you are serving them. And what you found difficult in the passing years, you are going to find them easy. You'll find my yoke is easy and my body in is light second corinthians chapter 12 second corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 and he said unto me my grace is sufficient for thee my grace is sufficient for thee stop worrying and stop being anxious and stop being fearful because the grace of god in this new year is sufficient for every one of us in jesus name and don't ever say, don't ever say, this I can do, this I cannot do. You can do all things. I said you can do all things. The Bible says you can do all things. The Holy Ghost is telling you now you can do all things. Through Christ who does watch, who strengthens you. It says, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather rejoice and glory in my infirmities that the power of God, of Christ, may rest upon me. That power is resting upon you already. There is saving grace. There is sustaining grace. There is sanctifying grace. There is strengthening grace, there is serving grace, and there is sufficient faith and wonderful. There's super abundant grace, just, just overflowing, overflowing, and you are going to reign. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound. All kinds of grace, all forms of grace, many sided, manifold grace of God. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things. Look at this all grace, all sufficiency in all things abound unto every good work. This year is going to be different. Grace will make each different. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, God's inconceivable grace for the sinner's salvation. God's inconceivable grace for the sinner's salvation. And then number two, God's incomprehensible grace for the saints' sanctification. The sinners cannot conceive of it. For them, God's inconceivable grace. Even for the believers for sanctification, God's incomprehensible grace for the same sanctification. Number three, God's incomparable grace for sacrificial service. God's incomparable grace for sacrificial service. Why is it incomparable? You see the companies of the world when they appoint a person to minister, to be a servant, to be a worker, they give him the tools, they give the machines, they give all the resources that are needed. 
And when they send them to the battlefield, they give all the ammo. But when God sends you to do service for him, he gives you all the resources that are needed. And there is no way to compare the resources he gives you or the resources the people of the world give their people. That's why it's God's incomparable grace for sacrificial service. We come to number one, God's inconceivable grace. For the sinners, salvation. The sinners in our locations, they're going to be saved. I said they're going to be converted. Even if they are being as hard, as terrible as Saul of Tarsus, the grace of God this year will arrest them and bring them into the gospel, into the grace of God, and bring them into the kingdom of God. We're coming back to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2 verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. You know, I can imagine Paul the apostle after he wrote that, before he wrote the next line, just look up and, and said, all men, all men, and me among them of all people. This grace bringing salvation and brought that salvation unto all men. Uh, he, he never stopped me surprised excited about the grace of God coming upon him in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer can you think about that and he was a persecutor and injurious but I obtained mercy. He said, I'm here now because of mercy. You are there now because of mercy. And you'll keep on being there until we see the Lord together by the mercy of God in Jesus' name. He said, because I did it ignorantly, in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding above abundant the grace of our lord upon me was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in christ jesus let's look at romans chapter 3 verse 23 romans chapter 3 verse 23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of god all have sinned and come short of the glory of god have you ever thought about the glory of god but I heard that in the Hebrews, Christ came to bring many sons unto glory. And yet, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How do we go from that level when we have all sinned? And we have come short of the glory of God. And then we are brought as one of the sons unto glory. That's, uh, that's what you are told in verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace. His grace that takes you from where you were. And takes you to the glory of God that we have all lost. And he says over here, being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus that grace will overflow in your life. We're told in Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 43. Acts 13. Reading from verse 43. Now when the congregation was broken up. Many of the Jews and the religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. Who speaking to them persuaded them. To continue in the grace of God. Challenges may come just continue in the grace of God. When your legs are tired and cannot carry you again. Stand there. Don't, don't, don't quit. Don't run away. Stand there in your weakness and continue in the grace of God. When the pressures come. When the persecutions come. And Paul had a lot to tell those people about persecution. The persecution of the saints. And then it appears you are saying, why me? How could this happen to me? Stop the question and just continue in the grace of God and the moment you begin to think about his love and about his mercy and about his grace upon you upon you in particular the strength will come grace will bring strength 
will bring energy, will bring enthusiasm, will bring power. And then when that grace comes, then you'll say, thank you, Lord, I can move on again. And you will move on in Jesus' name. And you know, that's what the Lord has done. He has paid all our debt. He has canceled all our sins. He has canceled all our condemnation. He has canceled everything that harassed us. You know, if you were to think of what you did in the past, don't think about it, just forget about it. But if you were to think about what you did in the past, you know, you'll be sorrowful throughout the day, throughout the week, and throughout the months, and throughout the years. But the Lord just even takes the memory away from your head, from your mind. And God looks at you as if you're an angel. You are justified. and ju Justified means he looks at you as if you have never in you of all people because of the grace the grace is within you the grace is around you and the grace cleanses you and the grace covers you and you stand side by side by an angel and God says I'm pleased in that angel I'm also well pleased concerning you God is happy concerning you and it is all of grace and all you have to do is receive more grace and more grace and more grace it will be abundant in your life I come to point number two, God's incomprehensible grace for the same sanctification. We're coming back to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 11 and verse 14. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace that... For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Then it says some other things. Then verse 14, who gave himself for us. Who gave himself for us. Who gave himself for us. Stop there for a moment. He gave himself. You know when Jesus was saying in the world. He gave healing. But he gave himself. Compare himself and then healing. When he was saying he gave deliverance. But he gave himself. Compare them. Somebody gave you a car. But he didn't give himself. He held himself back. And he sent his servant. He wrote a note on it. This car have the keys. Everything belongs to you. Can I talk to him? It's not available. Can I go to him and just say thank you very much? No, he's so busy you can't see him. He cannot give you his time. He will not give you his heart. He will not give you his love. But he can give you a gift. But Jesus Christ, he gave himself. And when somebody gave you this car, how much did you pay? Nothing. That's free. That's grace. When he gave himself, how much did we pay? Nothing. That's grace. And what did he give himself for? Look at that verse 14. He gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar people. Zealous of good works. All by grace. Don't tell anybody you find sanctification difficult. Why do you find it difficult? Ah, you have been thinking that you'll work it out yourself. You'll try your best. You'll, you know, nail yourself. You'll crucify yourself. You'll circumcise yourself. You'll sanctify yourself. Why are you trying to do that? When it is all of grace. And then you just come to the Lord and say, Lord, this is a gift. How many people think salvation is a gift? But then they think so sanctification, you have to earn that. You will sweat. And you will labor. And you, will, you have to, you know, struggle and scratch yourself. And get in the dust. And roll in the dust. And cry and weep. And, and do so. And then God is okay. You are you're, you're coming on. You are getting in. You are getting. Uh, uh, do that more. Struggle more. And try more. And sweat more. And walk more. And crucify yourself more. Then you are getting there. You are getting there. And you will never get as near enough. By that process, it is not of works, it is all of grace. He gave himself that he is not that we might redeem ourselves or that we might purify ourselves and then offer the purified person unto Christ, zealous of good works, but that he, Christ, he is a sanctifier. He is your sanctifier. And if nobody ever gets sanctified in the whole earth, you will be a sanctified vessel. 
if nobody around you can obtain it, can have it, and their sin is so difficult because they are struggling. They are trying each in their own strength. But thank God for you, for the grace of God in your life. You will have it. Why am I saying you will? You've got it already. Because the grace of God is available. And that grace is a sanctifying grace. And he gave himself that he is not, you know, our overseers that will sanctify you. You know, some people, eh, sometimes they write all these eh, letters that I told you not to write. You will not write bad letters again. I mean, a gracious hand will not write a bad letter. Am I right? You know, these hands here, these fingers here. It's not, the grace is not only in your heart. The grace is, you know, even on your eyes as you look at, and you look at somebody and say, look at this person. He looks gracious the way he's looking at me. His hands are gracious. His feet are gracious. Every, his mouth, gracious words are coming out. Gracious hands will not write bad letters again. Give me a good day. Amen. But you know, sometimes in the past, not now, not this new year, but in the old year, some people write and say, you know, pastor, our pastor is not uh, doing well because people in the church are not sanctified. You see, they want to sanctify them. Who is to sanctify them? God. Through who? Christ. It's the grace of God that comes through Jesus Christ. And if you respect your leaders, if you accept what they say, if you accept the word of God, as the word of God is coming through them, don't make comparison. Don't make comparison. And don't say, you know, a pastor is not preaching like pastor so-and-so. A pastor is not preaching like pastor so-and-so. Let Moses speak the way he can speak. You'll be blessed. Let Joshua minister the way God has raised him up, you'll be blessed. And let John the beloved in his soft tone. You know, John, when we get to heaven, you'll find that John doesn't shout like I shout. But I'm good. I'm all right. Shouting preacher is all right. And then a soft, silent preacher like John. John was all right. And Peter, you know, I think I'm like Peter. And Peter was all right, you don't make comparison. Do you understand? When you go back to your state, you know, your minister, your, your father in the Lord over there, your, your overseer comes and he opens the Bible, just say, praise the Lord, the grace of God is going to flow into my life through my pastor today. And don't think back and come back to, you know, these great men that come to preach over here and say, look at my pastor, it's not like so and so, no comparison. If you'll not make that comparison, the grace of God through your leadership will flow into your life in Jesus name and now it says it is the grace of God that he will purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works we're looking at Hebrews chapter 2 Hebrews chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 9 Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 but we see Jesus you will see him who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. And that he, by the grace of God, you see that, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings, for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. You are one of the brethren. And the grace of God will be abundant in your life in Jesus name. The grace of God brings us full salvation. What do we mean by full salvation? One, salvation from the penalty of sin. Two, salvation from the pollution of sin, all the defilement that sin had caused. When the grace of God comes into our lives, number one, it takes the penalty of sin away. Number two, it takes the pollution of sin away. Number three, salvation from presumptuous sins. That is presumption in sin. That is people will just, they know it's wrong, but there's a nature in them that is attracted to something that is evil. They know that they can't see coincidence. 
deadly, but there's something within them that will still do it. There's salvation from that presumptuousness in sin. And then, number four, salvation from the power of sin. You know, there are times that people don't even want to do something. And they say, I hate it. I detest it. I will not do it again. And they make resolutions upon resolutions. But the power of sin is so strong, it's so great, they cannot overcome. But when you come to the Lord as a taste of more grace, more grace, more grace, you have salvation from the power of sin. Number five, salvation from propensity to sin. Propensity to sin. You know that when, when there's a magnet within and there's a magnet without, the magnet within will be drawing you towards the magnet without. When there is the inbred sin, the inbred nature, uh, the, the nature, the body of sin, the body of iniquity within, it will make you to be leaning towards sinning. That's the propensity. But you see, when you come to the Lord, because of that grace of God, there is salvation from propensity city to sin. Number six, the salvation from the presence of sin. The presence of sin. While I want to do good, evil is present with me. I feel it within. I sense it within. I ache because of it. I detest it. I hate it. But the presence is still there all, all through, all the time. Even when it is not done outwardly, when no sin is committed visibly, externally, the inward sin is there, the presence of that sin. But then you come to the Lord and there is grace, abundant, because there is salvation from the presence of sin. And then number seven, salvation from the prince of sinners. The prince, who is the prince? That Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Is the prince of this world, and it's the one, the God of the sinners. It's the one that is ruling them, and there is salvation from that, but from that prince of sinners, all available by grace, God's incredible grace. God's incomprehensible grace and God's incalculable grace, God saves and God sanctifies all by grace. You've got it already. I come to point number three, God's incomparable grace for sacrificial service. As we look at what others have done, uh, maybe something will say to you, I can never do that. Please, brother, sister, cancel that language from your mouth. You see something that, uh, you know, this has done, that has done, and then you say, I can never do that. You will. You see, some of these, our, you know, leaders and ministers, they come on here, and when they take the microphone, they begin to open the Bible. You say, where did these people come from? Are they in this same ministry with us? Yes, they're in this same ministry. They're, they're just like you. And when it comes to your turn, you will do better. And then you say, as that brother is preaching, I just lay in line upon line, I can never do that. Don't say that again, you will do it. Because you see, it's all by grace. Whatever anybody has done, whatever anybody manifests, it's all by grace. I can picture Philip now as, you know, Philip was uh, just uh, one of those uh, deacons and leaders, elders in, in a Jerusalem, Jerusalem church. And uh, he wasn't even chosen at that time, just sitting there in the congregation. And here you see, so they were going, you know, the hour of prayer. Who knows whether Philip was going to church that same time. And here comes uh, Peter and John and then just looks at that a man and says, silver and gold have I none. What I have I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And then he held him and pulled him up. I can imagine Philip saying, I can never do that, but you will do it. And then you find that uh, Peter was just going like this. And then they brought all those sick people and the shadow coming on them. And the people were getting healed. I can imagine Philip saying, huh? These people, where did they get this kind of power, this kind of unction, this kind of authority? I can never do that. Don't say that again. You will. I said you will. And then now God does something wonderful. They didn't know it was wonderful. And God did something that will give progress. They didn't know it was it will bring progress. God did something that were incomprehensible. That's what we're talking about. Incomprehensible that you cannot understand. And they were scattered all about. And only Philip went where? 
Samaria. And he, when he got there, he saw there was no church there. Nothing there at all. And then he got there and, uh, he, and the, when they didn't allow them to even take microphone or instrument or, you know, whatever. They just they forgot everything behind. And then he got there, no microphone. He got there, no choir. He got there, no ushers. He got there, no security. Ushers are good and security people are good when you and choir people, they are good when you have them. But, you know, Philip was unlucky. I am lucky. I have, you know, all of you and we're serving together and you are there. And if I want you to sing, you sing and you bring all the roof down. And then before I preach, the people are prepared. Um, but Philip was not, not that lucky. And he was there all alone. And then he began to preach Jesus Christ. And come and see miracle. Come and see miracle. What he thought he could never do, he did. What you have been seeking, you'll not be able to do. You will do in Jesus' name. Don't worry. Don't worry about what you think you have, what you think you don't have. When you get to that Samaria and the grace of God fills your heart and stirs you up and you open your mouth and the words of grace and the words of power come out of your mouth, something will happen in Jesus' name. And that's why we're looking at God's incomparable grace. God's incomparable grace for sacrificial service in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Do I need any other sin? By the grace of God. Paul was who he was. Did he suffer in the prison without any murmur? By the grace of God. And was he beating without feeling the pain? All by the grace of God. And did he tell that a fellow, that lady following him in Philippi, these are the servants of God who show us the way of salvation. Did he say, come out of her right now? And did it happen? Yes, it happened. How? By the grace of God. Did he sing and praise the Lord with Silas? And then the prison doors were opened and everybody's bands were loose. Yes, it happened. All by the grace of God. Not because it was strong, not because we're powerful, not because we're special, all by the grace of God and because it's by grace, it's also on you today. I am what I am by the grace of God and then it says his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain but I labored more abundantly than they all yet not I think about that I labored more abundantly than all of them and yet not me he said but the grace of God which was with me is that grace here today I said is that grace here today are you a recipient of that grace? All the grace you need to do, everything you need to do, is it available for you? Why don't you stand up and receive it from the Lord? More grace, greater grace, abundant grace, super abundant grace upon your life. And there will never be anything the Lord has called you to do that you will not be able to do. Now today you are well able. Now today you are well able. Now from today, you are well able. Yes, you can. Yes, you will. The grace of God is there. The grace of God is a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's not by marriage. And God loves you. Loves you more than you can tell. Loves you more than you can imagine. He loves you. Whatever happened in the past, he loves you more than you can tell. All you need to do is to say, Lord, you know everything about me. How can I come on the basis of marriage? How can I come on the basis of being qualified for this or for that? You know me too well. I cannot plead deserving anything. But I come on the basis of mercy and love and grace. And the grace that took Paul from where he was and took him to where he wanted him to be. My brother, my sister, that grace is available. Wipe your tears away. Take the sorrow away. Take all that regret away. I've wasted my chance. No, you have not. No opportunity for me again. Don't say that again. I can never amount to anything good again. Don't say that again. I cannot do this. I cannot do that. Don't open your mouth and say such, any, such a sin again. 
grace. God's grace. God's abundant grace available for you. And that grace is available in greater, greater measure. He giveth more grace as the burdens grow greater. He giveth more grace as the burdens go, grow greater. He sendeth more strength as our labors increase. To added afflictions, he addeth mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. Multiplication of the peace of God in your life. The increase of the grace of God in your life. You feel ashamed because of what so and so knows about you. Don't worry about what they know about you. That's the old self. That's what you are in the, pla in the past. Grace has come today. Has turned everything around. And you will not be like you used to be anymore. When we have exhausted our store of endurance. When our strength has failed. Before the day is half done. When we reach the end of our hoarded resources. A father's full grace is given. And it only begins even at that point. His love has no limits. His grace for you has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Christ Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth and giveth again. He giveth and giveth. He giveth and giveth. And giveth and giveth and giveth again. He gives you more grace. You will be who God has called you to be. You will do what God has appointed you to do. There's no devil out of the pit of hell that can stop your progress. Grace has called you. Grace is possessing you. And grace will see you through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. And we bless your name for the revelation of your grace. Not only the revelation, also the giving out of your grace to every brother, every sister, every minister that is facing any challenge. Oh Lord, I pray today, everyone will find your grace sufficient for them in Jesus' name. I pray, oh Lord, all the negative things you have been saying before. I cannot do that. I can never do that. I cannot amount to anything. I have spoiled my chance. I've done this. I've done that. Oh Lord, cut them away from my mouth in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, help us to be conscious of your grace. And conscious of your mercy. And conscious of your love. And know that because of your grace, the past is forgiven. The past is gone. A new day, a new year has come. And this year will be a year of your grace abundantly supplied in every life. In Jesus' name. And Lord, as we look at one another, as we relate with one another, we talk graciously to one another. And we handle one another graciously. And we help one another graciously. And we encourage one another graciously. So that Lord, as the grace, as we are enjoying your grace, will help other people to, to enjoy more of your grace. And as we go back to our various churches, when we preach, when we encourage, when we counsel, when we challenge, whatever we do, we do it in such a gracious manner. Your grace will be flowing into the congregation in Jesus name. If there's any brother, any sister here, Lord, this morning, you are loving God, a good God, a merciful God, carrying any burden on their shoulders, on their mind, and they have heavy hearts, lift all their burdens. Show them more of your grace. 
and let them, Lord, become light and be walking as if they're even not stepping on the ground again. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. And the power of the Lord will uphold you. Underneath you will be the everlasting arms. And you'll find every day as you grow older, every day as you move on in the work of the Lord, the grace of God will be increasing and increasing in your life. Lord, confirm it in every life. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. So I just thank God. Third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to stay out for a I just thank God for all this. I just blessed you with great.